Okay, my dear students, once again, I'm Sean Xavier Alcalita, and we'll proceed to the next topic for Chapter 3, um, Part 1 of the topic for STS, which is the Information Age. So before we start, please don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube page. Okay, from here, at the end of this lesson, the students should be able to define what is information age, discuss the history of information age, and understand the factors that need to be considered in checking website sources. So let's talk about the information age. So it's a period starting in the last quarter of the 20th century when information became effortlessly accessible through publications and through the management of information by computers and computer networks. And moreover, it is also so called the digital age and the new media age because it was associated with the development of the computers. Okay, so here's the history of computers and information technology. So I provided here the timeline of the information age, the year, as well as the event. No? Um, and way back 5,000 years ago, the Sumerian writing system used pictographs to represent words. So it's it's uh, like a drawing. No? Uh, with the drawing, you can already represent what what word are you trying to convey, you know, what message you're trying to convey. And moreover, in 2900 BC, the Egyptian hieroglyphic writing, you know, hieroglyphics, and next one, the tortoise shell or the oracle bone writing were used uh, through the use of the turtle, uh, the shell of the turtle. Next one is the papyrus roll. It's uh, made from the skin of an animal. It's used as a writing material. Then for the Chinese, uh, they created a small seal writing was developed. Um, small, uh, Chinese small seal writing. And the book, the parchment codex, the woodblock printing and paper was invented by the Chinese. Now in 1455 AD, um, Johann Gutenberg um, invented a printing press using a movable metal type and the first book that is being printed in his printing press was the Holy Bible and that is why it is called as the Gutenberg Bible and 1755 Samuel Johnson's dictionary standardized English spelling in 1802 the Library of Congress was established Moreover, the invention of the carbon arc lamp. And in 1824, the research on persistence of vision was published. Next one is on 1830s. Uh, first viable design for digital computer. Augusta Lady Byron writes the world's first computer program. And the invention of the telegraph in Great Britain and United States. That is why um, if you use the telegraph, you should know the Morse code, the dot and the dash. Um, next one is the motion pictures were projected onto the screen. In 1876, the D-Way decimal system was introduced and until now, it is still being used in the library for the arrangement of the books in the library according to the numbers from 001 to 099 a general information uh, 100 to 199 that is philosophy like that that is a Dewey decimal system in 1877 Edward Muybridge demonstrated high-speed photography and first magnetic recordings were released in 1899 in the early 1902 the motion picture special effects were used uh, Lee DeForest invented the 
electronic amplifying tube or the triode. In 1923, the television camera tube was invented by Zivorkin. Then in 1926, the first practical sound movie. In 1939, um, that was the first no, in history. A regularly scheduled TV broadcasting began in the United States. Then in 1940s, the beginnings of information science as a discipline. Then in 1945, a Vannevar Bush foresaw the invention of the hypertext. 1946, the INIAC computer was developed. And I guess this is one of the first uh, mainframes ever created or ever invented in the history. One of the mainframes. No? In 1948, the birth of field of information theory proposed by Claude Shannon. In 1957, a planar transistor was developed by John Horney. Next, in 1958, the first integrated circuit was invented. 1960s, the Library of Congress was developed. Uh, developed uh, uh, Library of Congress developed the LC Mark machine readable code. In 1969, Unix operating system was developed which could handle multitasking. So this is the example here, the Unix. Next, in 1971, the Intel introduced the first microprocessor chip. This one, this is the first microprocessor chip um, uh, uh, developed by Intel. And today, what is uh, the microprocessor chip that's used by Intel today is Core i3, uh, core i5, Core i7, like that. No? Next one is the optical laser disc in 1972, developed by Philips and MCA. Next, two years later, the MCA and Philips agreed on a standard video disc encoding format. Then, 1975, the Altair microcomputer kit was released. The first personal computer for the public, so that was the first PC. Um, introduced for public use in the public. Then in 1977, Radio Shack introduced the first complete personal computer. Then in 1984, um, Steve Jobs introduced the Apple Macintosh computer. That one. So that's the first Macintosh, Apple Macintosh computer from the Apple company of, Steve, of the late Steve Jobs. Okay, next one is 1980s. The artificial intelligence was separated from information science or information technology. 1987, the hypercard was developed by Bill Atkinson, recipe box metaphor. In 1991, 450 complete works of literature on one CD-ROM was released. In January of 1997, the RSA encryption and network security software, so internet security code crack for 48-bit number. So that was one of the first internet security code ever uh, ever created. No? So that contains also the antivirus as well to, to scan, to detect viruses from the World Wide Web. Okay, so let's go over now to the types of computer. So the first type is a personal computer, the PC. So it's a multi-purpose computer whose size, capabilities, and price make it feasible for individual use. So personal computers are intended to be operated directly by an end user rather than by a computer expert or technician. Okay, so the next one. The next one is the desktop. So the desktop computer is a personal computer. Actually, it's a PC designed for regular use at a single location on or near a desk or table due to its large size. Moreover, it's 
uh, it's a tower case um, uh, it's so heavy and also the power requirements so you need to have a um, um, automatic voltage regulator or AVR no uh, for uh, as a uh, as a power requirement to uh, to function it to function uh, the desktop computer so it is a computer that fits under a desk on or under the desk no it has a monitor and another dis or another display so in one um, in one um, tower case or in one PC you can also use uh, multiple um, multiple monitors all at the same time okay with a keyboard mouse and either horizontal or vertical tower form factor uh, unlike laptop which is portable a desktop computer usually stays at one location but today desktop computers today goes mobile and not only mobile um, it could also fit into your own pocket so the Intel uh, has launched recently launched the, the one the smallest uh, desktop and even a pocket desktop invented and that was called as a NUC or NUC desktop this one it's the smallest desktop and today it is already powered with um, Intel Core i7 processor so this is an example of a NUC desktop okay the next one is a laptop it's a small portable personal computer with a clamshell form factor um, typically having a thin LCD and LED computer screen map on the inside of the upper lid of the clamshell so it's look like a clamshell um, actually it's it can be open um, just like a clamshell and an alphanumeric keyboard on the inside of the lower lid um, the next one is the personal digital assistant is a term for a small mobile and handheld device that provides computing and information storage and retrieval capabilities for personal or business use often for keeping schedules calendars address book um, phone book so that is already information handy and popular in the early 1900s and early in the year early 2000s now um, personal digital assistants were the precursors to smartphones no, and that was the first one, the pump top. Uh, that the example there that I give you, that's the one of the first uh, PDAs being used before the existence of the uh, uh, smartphones. And today, uh, the PDA today is already a smartphone, <laughs> and almost everyone uses a smartphone. Uh, almost all, even students, college students, also use smartphones and that is already considered as a PDAs today no? uh, not only um, calendars keeping information phone book but even can store uh, music you can listen to a radio you can uh, watch a movie um, can surf the internet like that Okay, so most PDAs had a small physical keyboard and some had electronically sensitive pad on which handwriting could be received. And today, um, technology today with regards to smartphones, smartphones today are already uh, have a screen, um, touch screen features. So there's no need for you to have a physical keyboard for that. Okay, next. In computing, a server is a piece of computer hardware or software that provides functionality for other programs or devices called clients. This architecture is called a client server model. This is the picture of a Google data center just right below uh, from the Google company which has 2.5 million servers way back in 2016. It has eight data centers 
in the United States, one in South America, four in Europe, and two in Asia, particularly Taiwan and Singapore. So, why is it that Google has 2.5 million servers? It's because Google today is one of the largest, or for me, it's the largest, um, uh, the largest um, search engine in our in the internet today and most of all moreover uh, from yahoo to google uh, m more people are using gmails um, google drives clouds so all the information that is being uploaded to the google drive is being stored here in the google data center that is why we are the clients in the server of google so um, each or every every Gmail user has one um, uh, free uh, Google Drive, which is worth 10 gigabytes of storage. No, um, it is free. But if you want to subscribe for 100 gigabytes, you have to subscribe for monthly pay for about 90 pesos per month. Okay, the next one is the mainframe computer. So informally called a mainframe or big iron, it's a computer used primarily by large organizations for critical applications, bulk data processing such as census and industry and consumer statistics, enterprise resource planning and large scale uh, transaction processing. The next one is the last one here is the wearable computer. So um, it's in any small technological device capable of storing and processing data that can be worn on the body. Wearable computers are designed for accessibility and convenience as well as improvements to workplaces by making information quickly and readily available to the wearer. So today, um, one of the best example here is the smartwatch, and in the smartwatch, it can detect your um, uh, your heart rate, uh, blood pressure, blood oxygen, uh, and also your fitness level. It could also detect um, uh, through the connection of your Bluetooth. It can connect uh, phone calls as well as your messages from the uh, Facebook and text messages no and that is one of the uh, latest technology that we have today but on the next uh, later on in the next slide I will I will show you one of the latest wearable computers available in the market today which is the iGlass the Google Glass one of that is a Google Glass okay <laughs> Watch out, New York, Alex has a pair of smart glasses. So, how do they work? There's a holographic display on the right lens that shows notifications and information directly from your phone. This is all controlled by a small ring called the loop, which allows you to navigate and interact with your display all via Bluetooth. The idea was, what can we create that can be part of your everyday life and seamlessly fit into your life and give you all of those benefits of being connected to the world. From the home screen alone, I could check the time, weather, messages, calendar notifications, locations, and even my battery life. Pretty much everything I could check on my phone. Well, maybe not everything, just the things I wanna know right away. It even has Alexa integrated into the glasses, so you can ask Alexa questions through the built-in mic and speaker. Focals can even let you call an Uber. You better believe we tried all these features along the way. First stop, getting fitted. At North Showroom in Brooklyn, they custom fitted me and even gave me a quick demo of what I would experience when wearing them. A pretty unique sizing process, measuring my head size, width between my eyes, and other measurements to make sure the hologram would perfectly align with my eyes. The crazy part is they are just made for me, so no one else could see the hologram display while wearing my glasses. 
I hear a little beeps uh, in my right ear, but nothing's showing up. Am I not looking in the right place? <laughs> After a few weeks, my glasses were ready to be picked up and sized for my final fitting. I just got them! Woohoo! It is officially day one of me wearing my Focal Smart glasses. I'm heading into the office and mostly going to be sitting at my desk during the day, just kind of performing simple daily tasks. I'm going to just try and get used to the look and the feel of these and see how my first day goes. I wanted to take my Focals a step further today. I figured it's day one, why not? So I tried out the GPS feature to get me from my apartment to the pass station. Alexa, how do I get to the Hoboken Pass Station? Directions to Pass Station. Hoboken on Hudson Lakes and River Road in Hoboken. Turn left onto First Street. It's kind of neat having each step pop up, and then it will go away in about five seconds. So it's not very distracting if I'm walking or crossing the street. And at one point, I intentionally wanted to make a wrong turn to see if it would reroute me. And it didn't, so that was like a little disappointing and kind of shows that their GPS is not so accurate. I'm used to wearing glasses, I do wear them on a daily basis, but after wearing these vocals for a full day, my eyes do seem more tired. Alexa, what's the weather today? In Hoboken, it's 6 degrees Fahrenheit with clear skies. I just got to the office and I'm going to put my phone down for the day and just rely on my smart glasses. I was already informed that when I'm sending a voice to text message to one of my contacts, a different number will appear when they receive the message. Okay, so I did pick up my phone just because I posted an Instagram story, but no more phone today. I can't help it if my glasses don't let me check social media. Stay warm. My eyes took a while to get adjusted to the focals. At times they felt heavy, slid down my nose, became loose, and I even had to get them refitted. As my week went on, the holographic display was very out of focus and even glitchy at times. I even lost a nose pad, which kind of threw off all the display and I couldn't really see anything. So I ended up going back to the store to get them realigned and tightened to fit my face. Let's just say day four was the true test when I tried calling an Uber right from my focals. K Street Subway Station. I have the option to walk or Uber and we're going with the Uber. This Uber is six minutes away and it's $8. Looking for ride. It was a little complicated ordering the Uber for my focals. I did have to bring out my phone just to kind of see some of the notifications for when my driver is arriving. It's kind of neat, it is giving me updates throughout my ride and it's saying I'm three minutes away from my destination. I tried texting and responding more and even using my calendar with the glasses. Schedule a meeting for tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. I ran some errands and asked Alexa to guide me to the local grocery store. Would you like directions to organic basic food? LLC on 204 Washington Street in Hoboken. Which again, wasn't an easy navigating experience. Before I knew it, my journey into the future of tech had come to an end. After a full week of wearing my focals, here are my final thoughts. As for the comfort and fit of the focals, they were really uncomfortable at times. They felt even heavy and they would slide down my nose so I had to kind of keep pushing them back up and just really bulky on the sides. Alexa was not very effective when I was in a loud or noisy environment. She couldn't easily connect and understand the commands that I was asking her. This just became really frustrating sometimes and I wanted to just pick up my phone. The holographic display wasn't super clear and easy to see in the sun, so I often used my sun clips. As for the loop, it died a lot faster than the focals, and that could have just been because I was navigating most of the time with the loop. But the good part was I was able to get all my notifications on my focals, and I was a lot more hands-free and relied a lot less on my phone. North has a lot of great features so far and they have a lot more to kind of grow and integrate into these vocals, but it would be nice if I could play my music on them, maybe even pick up a phone call and watch some videos. Okay, so the next one is the World Wide Web, the internet. So the internet is a worldwide system of interconnected networks 
that facilitate data transmission among innumerable computers. Internet was used mainly by scientists to communicate with the other scientists. It remained under government control until 1984. One early problem faced by internet users was the speed, particularly here in the Philippines. That is why um, the president has issued a uh, an ultimatum to the telcos to improve the uh, to improve the internet speed by December of 2020. Mm. Okay. So the development of fiber optic cables allowed for billions of bits of information to be received every minute. So electronic mail or email was a suitable way to send a message. Okay, so applications of computers in science and research. Uh, human brain cannot store all genetic sequences of organisms, so this huge amount of data can only be stored, analyzed, and be used efficiently with the use of computers. So bioinformatics is the application of information technology to store, organize, and analyze vast amount of biological data. Okay, so the next one will be about the how to uh, the criteria on how to uh, how to verify a reliable information from the World Wide Web. It's because most uh, most in the internet sources contains fake news. Okay. Okay, so here, um, one of the ways to evaluate your internet source is the use of cards, uh, C-A-R-R-D-S-S. So C is for credibility, so who is the author, what are his or her credentials. A is for accuracy, so accuracy can be used as uh, facts statistics or other information be verified through other sources based on your knowledge does the information seem accurate r is for reliability does the source present a particular view or bias so is the is the uh, is the source reliable um, is it objective or biased next is for ne next r is for relevance <coughs> Does this information directly support my hypothesis or thesis or help my help to answer my question? The next one is D, the date. When was this information created? When was it revised? Are these dates meaningful in terms of the subject matter? The first S is source, the source behind the text. Did the author use reliable and credible sources? And the last S will be the scope. Does this source address my hypothesis, thesis, or question in a comprehensive or peripheral way? Is it scholarly or popularly treat, uh, popular treatment? So these are one of the ways of evaluating your internet source using the cards. But however, on the last slide on the next slide uh, the Lydia M. Olson library shares also another way of the of determining the the reliability of the internet source so using the six criteria so the first one is the authority. So when we say authority, is it clear who is responsible for the context of the page? Is there a way of verifying the legitimacy of the organization, group, company, or individual? Is there any indication of the author's qualifications for writing on a particular topic? Is the information from the source known to be reliable? Next one is the accuracy. Are the sources for factual information clearly listed so they can be verified in another source? 
is the information free of grammatical spelling and on other typographical errors um, then the third one is the objectivity does the content appear to contain any evidence of bias or mm -hmm. um, is the link or to a page describe Describing the goals or purpose of sponsoring organization or company um, If there is any advertising on the page, is it clearly differentiated from the informational content? The next one is the currency. Are there any dates on the page to indicate when the page was written? When the page was first placed on the web or when the page was last revised? Um, the other one here is the coverage the fifth criteria is the coverage. Are these topics successfully addressed with clearly presented arguments and adequate support to substantiate them? Does the work update other sources, substantiate other materials you have read or add new information? Is the target audience identified and appropriate for your needs? And last one is the appearance. Does the site look well organized? Do the links work? Does the site appear well maintained? So these are the six criteria of, of identifying reliable internet, pay, uh, internet or web page. So for the discussion points, for your assignment, uh, who are the contributors of the technological advances of the information age? And the next question will be, aside from the communication, what are the other aspects of society is or are being influenced in the information age? Okay, for the summary, Nowadays, information could be shared or transferred quickly. Various aspects of our society are also being influenced by the information age, especially communication, communication, economics, industry, health, and the environment. And the rapid, rapid upgrade of information poses both positive and negative impacts to our society. Okay, so thank you very much for watching and listening. Uh, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe my YouTube page for more videos. So once again, I'm Sean Sevier Alquilita, now signing off.